Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Kenneth Gibbs. Kenneth is a, an M13 scholar who is currently at um, Stanford University School of Medicine, and his talk is entitled, Leukemia Stem Cells Display Attenuated Signaling Networks. section I am an immunologist by training and so really it's a stem cell talk though and so I think that's why I'm here um, and it's about defining what happens in normal stem cells and then how that process goes awry and the sort of malignancies that result as a, as a result of that. And so first I want to think about let's just put in a little bit of context what makes stem cells unique and so then you have to compare them to normal cells and so most of the cells that you have will give rise to a cell that is just like it, right? So you have a cell cycle, a mother cell divides and gives rise to two identical daughter cells, which can do this for a limited amount of time. It doesn't do this indefinitely. Cells are continually being replaced and other cells are coming up. And so the two qualities that you can think of this as... Sorry, I'm very loud, so I don't think I need that. Um, <laughs> they have limited replicative potential, and they uh, have no lineage potential. So an orange cell gives rise to an orange cell. So the thing that is important about stem cells that makes them different, they're defined by these two properties. One is called long-term self renewal, and one is multi-lineage potential. The second is much more simple to define. Multi-lineage potential means that a stem cell can give rise to multiple different mature cell types, or the daughter cell one that can give rise to multiple different cell types. And so this is, the stem cell is self-renewing, and so one of the cells that can, in the division, can, will actually be identical to the parental stem cell, and it will do this for the lifetime of the individual. Um, it gives rise to progenitors, which can, again, have this multi-lineage potential, but do it for a limited time. And so this is one of the things that makes stem cells interesting. Embryonic stem cells are the things you hear about in the news. They have what's called total lineage potential, so they can make heart, lung, tissue, skin, whatever the case may be. But as adults, you have stem cells for each of your specific tissues. And as an immunologist, the tissue that we focus on is the blood. Um, so in the blood, you have a hematopoietic stem cell, which gives rise to its own set of progenitors which are multi-potential, and then they become committed, and they give rise to different lineages of mature blood cells, and they have their own unique functions, which are important. Um, importantly, hematopoietic stem cells are defined by these so-called CD markers, which are markers that, when you use different combinations of them, you help you to identify a certain cell type. And so a hematopoietic stem cell is defined generally by saying CD34 positive, so it expresses this marker CD34, and it does not express this marker CD38. Um, so one thing about hematopoietic stem cells and stem cells generally is that they're very rare. And as such, a lot of the traditional biochemistry methods that you use to study cell biology, you can't use because it'll do things like a Western blot or an ELISA, which require you to take 100,000 cells. But if you take an umbilical cord, for example, which is a rich source of hematopoietic stem cells, you can get at most 10,000 cells. So a knowledge gap exists, and we need to think what actually governs stem cell behaviors, and this is one of the questions that we're focusing on. To make an analogy, though, I was thinking um, when I was sitting around yesterday, Dr. Bosky is sort of like a stem cell. He's extremely <laughs> rare and extremely potent, right? And we don't really fully understand what governs his behavior. And I think he can, <laughs> can self-renew because he seems to have limitless energy and, you know, can kind of give rise to committed progenitors, which are the Meyerhoff staff, <laughs> give rise to multiple lineages of mature students, right? And so you can see analogies between nature and the Meyerhoff program. But again, Focusing back on the research question, how is the behavior of hematopoietic stem cells regulated? This is what we're getting at. So this gives us to the concept of cell signaling, which is a general mechanism by which cells regulate each other's behavior. So what you'll have here is a hematopoietic growth factor, so a, or we call them cytokines. And so this is a signal that comes from some external cell. It'll bind a receptor on the cell surface and then through a number of events lead to a number of outcomes, such as survival, differentiation, proliferation, and apoptosis. Some of the mediators that do this are these so-called stat proteins, which are transcription factors, which, when they are phosphorylated, can then bind to the DNA and cause an upregulation of a number of different genes. Another mediator that's downstream of these cytokines, the cytokine receptors, is ERK, which is a kinase, which, again, will phosphorylate various transcription factors and get all these different outcomes. Importantly, these outcomes take a number of, take a while to happen, right? So apoptosis will happen in, in some period of time. Cell survival and differentiation the cell cycle will take maybe 24 hours. You can look at these events very rapidly after engagement of the cytokine receptor as close as 10 to 15 minutes. And so you can use phosphorylation of stat proteins or ERK as a surrogate for 
uh, an, end, an end stage uh, function. Um, and so and one thing that's important to note is that when there's dysregulation of these pathways, you end up with a number of diseases. And so usually these are very tightly regulated, so they're only active when there's an external signal present. And so sometimes cell will have mutations where these things become constitutively active, and they are always dividing, and you end up with things like cancer, all, all sorts of uh, blood diseases. And so the way that we study this is flow cytometry. And so flow cytometry is a technique in which you use antibodies, which can be specific for proteins on the cells of the surface, and in our case, they're specific for these phosphorylated epitopes on these signaling molecules. And you can use different combinations of them to study uh, single cell types within heterogeneous bunch, as well as the signaling events within those cell types. So let's walk through what an experiment would look like. You would take your cell type of interest, and then you stimulate it with these cytokines and growth factors that I was speaking of uh, a moment ago. After about 15 minutes, you, you, fix, you fix the cell, and so what this does is it halts the signaling at that moment. And this is important because, as I said, those signaling pathways are tightly regulated, and so you don't want to keep them on for forever, right? You know, you want to have, have the signal, have the cell get that signal, and then move on quickly. And so you can fix it to sort of see what was the stem cell thinking at that moment when we applied that stimulus. This also preserves markers on the cell surface, which will allow us to then identify a single subcell, a single cell like a stem cell within a heterogeneous population. We then permeabilize these cells with uh, methanol or ethanol, which will allow antibodies to cross the membrane and then bind these phosphorylated epitopes, which are in the nucleus. And, and antibodies cannot cross membranes traditionally. Um, we then stain with markers that are specific for the cell surface protein as well as those phosphorylated epitopes. And I talked about the stat proteins in ERK, which my talk will focus on, but those of you who are familiar with cell biology will know that there are a number of phosphorylated uh, effector proteins, and this can be used for a number of different proteins, and I can talk to you about that later if you're interested. And then you analyze these cells using full cytometer. And so again, you look at each cell one by one, it's, it's, it's excited by the laser, and you can read multiple parameters which will allow you to determine what the cell surface phenotype is, you can determine if it's a stem cell or not, as well as what's going on inside the cell. And let's see, let's see. So then you get data, so you identify your live cells, and this is something <coughs> that happened from peripheral blood, and so again, you can, oh, uh, where are we going? So, all right, so you look at your live cell gate, and then you can say, all right, you can use again those CD markers to say, all right, a CD3 positive cell or T cell, or CD20 cell or B cell, for example, and then you can look within each of those cell types and look at the phosphorylation um, events. So key to this method is being able to recognize cell types when they're live, and then also being able to recognize them as you fix and permeabilize the cells, which is important for the method in determining what's happening inside the cell. And so from cord blood, you see that, again, these CD markers, hematopoietic stem cells generally defined as CD34 positive and 38 negative. This is a contour plot, which represents the, uh, I guess the more groups you see, you see more cells in that particular area. And so you would look down in this, in this corner and say, all right, this is where my stem cells are, and then you can go one layer deeper and say within that population, we have this population of cells that again, is defined by a certain panel of CD markers, and you say these are hematopoietic stem cells. So this is what it looks like if you take cells from a live cord. So what happens if we fix and primary cells? Again, we can see that the architecture is grossly maintained, and we have roughly the same percentages of cells, so this is encouraging. And then we again can see that you know the markers stay more or less intact, and so we're able to see to find a hematopoietic stem cell after our method, the same way you can when a cell is live. Um, and this is very important for the method because again, it's one of those garbage in, garbage out things. You can say something is a stem cell grossly, but if you don't have confidence you're actually seeing what you're supposed to be seeing, you'll draw a false conclusion. And um, this is one of those things that I guess from the undergrad is a testament. You need to be persevered because when I first started doing this, this slide might seem simple, but it took seven months to be able to make something that looked like this and do it reproducibly. So sometimes you have to just kind of drill and drill and drill at it because you have an idea and you just have to make the tools necessary to make that happen. So we've talked about cell signaling, stem cells, all these other things. So let's put it all together. Do stem cells respond to these cytokine stimuli? And it's a fundamental question that has not yet been answered. Um, so again, we have two of these stat markers. On the x-axis is stat 3. On the y-axis is stat 5. All right? And so you can see when the cells are not stimulated, the, cell, the population more or less resolves as one population in the bottom left quadrant. 
You can see it put any GCSF, the cytokine, which is important for the maturation of cells to become granule sites, one of the mature blood lineages, that a subset of the cells moves out in the stat 3 direction, which is what you would expect for a traditional cell doing GCSF signaling. So this is important, and actually it is counter the paradigm, because the paradigm is that hematopoietic stem cells do not respond directly to cytokine perturbation, and in particular GCSF is one of the cytokines that they're not thought to respond to. Um, and again, you can see here that not all stem cells behave identically, right? Only a subset of the cells is actually moving. And so you can see within a population, all stem cells aren't created equal, and that they actually are able to respond. And it's not a one uh, cytokine, I guess, trick, because you can see with thrombopoietin, that's a cytokine which is important for platelet formation, they also respond here, and this time using a different mediator, STAT5. So you can see that the method works. You can look at a lot of different mediators, and again, there are downstream effects which we can talk about um, later, but that stem cells can respond to these multiple mediators. And so these are stem cells from the core blood. In adults, your stem cells reside in the bone marrow. And so again, you can see when they're not simulated, they hang out right here. But now you can compare it. If you compare the GCSF and the uh, core blood versus the marrow, you can see a significantly greater portion of the cells are actually responding. And they're responding in a stat 3 and a stat 5 direction. So the quantitatively and qualitatively different responses. So again, all stem cells aren't created equal. The stem cells that you get from an umbilical cord are not the same as the stem cells which are residing in the bone marrow. But one thought is, all right, well, are these always more active? And you can see here with the TIPO, the responses are pretty comparable. And so maybe some responses are maintained throughout life with the same sort of level where the other responses are becoming more active as, as the person ages. Again, this is very preliminary, and we have to do more work to make a functional outcome of that. But you can say that there are some differences. And so the abstract did talk about cancer, so let's get there. Um, normally, you have a hematopoietic stem cell, which can do all these things. And so there's this paradigm now that um, says that hematopoietic stem cell, one of these progenitors, might be hit with a leukemogenic event, that is, a genetic event which results in leukemia formation. And so again, as I said, hematopoietic stem cells can self-renew. So for the lifetime of the individual, they give rise to all these different mature lineages. So leukemic stem cell also has this, pretend, has this capability of self-renewal, and so it can continue to give rise to these various types of leukemia cells now um, for the lifetime of an individual. Um, and the thought is that most of the treatments that we have now are targeting these downstream cells, but again, stem cells have this sensing mechanism, and so they give rise to the cells afterwards. So you target these cells, the disease goes away for a while, but the stem cell is still there, so it goes back, and the current paradigm in treatment for a number of malignancies says that you need to identify and eradicate these cells in particular to have a curative treatment. Um, and so again, it's also defined as 34 positive and 38 negative, and the disease that we're looking at is acute myeloid leukemia, which is defined as an immature <coughs> accumulation of these immature cells that are blast in the bone marrow. And so again, this leukemia is thought of as a block in differentiation. And I told you before we were looking at, in normal stem cells, they respond to this differentiating cytokine, GCSF. So what happens in leukemia? All right, so this plot is slightly different, but I think it illustrates the point very well. Um, so here, you have on the x-axis CD34, on the y-axis CD38, and coming out is the color, and that basically is the fluorescence intensity of our stat protein. And so as you go up the scale, you get more color, or you get more intensity, which means there's more phosphorylation that's happening. Um, so you can see when the, when the cells aren't stimulated, there's more or less an equal distribution of the color across the map. So let's apply GCSF, this differentiating cytokine. You can see that, okay, the cells are pretty much equal here, and now you can see that upon stimulation, this one population becomes exceedingly bright. This is not the leukemic stem cell population, however. It's not really responding. It has this what's called attenuation. It's not having a full out response. Um, and so this is interesting, right? Because if you think of leukemia as a blocking differentiation, you can see, say maybe, again, this has to be flushed out a little bit more, but these leukemic stem cells aren't actually responding to the differentiating uh, stimuli. And this happens in multiple patients, again, this population here, it's all red. And here, you know, it, may, it might become a little bit orangish, but again, they're not responding as robustly as even those cells that are the next differentiative step from the leukemic stem cell population. But this doesn't say that leukemic stem cells can't respond at all, because again, I told you about ERK, which is another mediator. And here, unstimulated, everything's red. And here you can see in this population, they are the most brightly responding cells. And so we're saying, all right, they don't respond very well to these uh, myeloid differentiating cytokines, but they are able to respond to other things such as this uh, diacylglycerol home log. It's not physiological, but it, it drives the point home that they can actually respond to other stimuli. So what do we learn from this? Hematopoietic stem cells and other populations within the blood 
of the genetic populations respond directly to cytokine stimulation. Um, and we see that HFC from core blood and adult marrow have distinct cytokine response profiles, and that within a gate uh, that's called hematopoietic stem cells, they're not all created equal, either within a certain population, as it, at the core blood or in the bone marrow, or when you compare them across populations. And making analogies to leukemia, we see leukemic stem cells show a block in the response to these various stimulations that promote myeloid differentiation, GCSF and GMCSF, which I didn't show you, but not all stimuli, such as PMA and itomycin and um, IL-6. So I just have to thank um, a lot of people who helped make this happen. Uh, the, my lab is wonderful, so Erica O'Donnell is actually a university <coughs> alumnus, uh, class of O3. She wasn't in my office, but she's, she's wonderful. Peter, Matt, Angelica, and my collaborators in the Weissman lab. And I'm funded in part by the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. And I also have to thank my uh, program, Stephanie Immunology, my classmate, uh, Nikki Green, who, uh, you know, she was part of the program there. She's out, at U she's out at Stanford now, and she's wonderful. She helps keep me off that ledge when I'm wondering why I'm in grad school, and she helps pull me back. And the Mayhawk program for, you know, allowing me to dream big and have that dream come true. So, I'll take any questions you have. I think we have time for one quick question. Yes? In the slide that you were showing the responses to the stem cell, mm -hmm. um, in comparison to the umbilical cord mm -hmm. stem cell in the bone mm -hmm. marrow, mm -hmm. you had a graph that shows the response of the uh, cytokine. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what the direction of the cell movement suggested, like whether it moves about the x axis or the y axis. Yeah, and so you're talking about this slide right here. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically you have two different mediators here. And so STAT3 has, is one of the mediators, STAT5 is another one of those mediators. They each have distinct downstream pro um, effects. And generally they thought of as both sort of promoting cell growth and cell proliferation. But, so if you see GCSF, if it moves this way, that means it's responding to STAT3 and not STAT5. Here you can see it's responding to STAT5 and not STAT3, and here it's responding to both. Right? Some of the cells are responding to both, some are just responding to stat 3. And so once you can precisely define what's happening at the cellular level, you can precisely define what's happening normally, and then you can say, all right, what's going wrong with these disease manifestations, and then how do we design a strategy to uh, you know, then combat that.